And so I don't see the button. All right, so here we go. So Jack pointed out that the article says a well-informed electorate preserves a democracy. And then the question is, do we have a well-informed electorate? And if not, are we going to be able to preserve our democracy? And then what is a well-informed electorate? All right. So Alex, you probably have opinions about that. Um, yeah, I do actually. Um, from the past conversations that we've had, um, especially when you know how important it is, uh, how important it is to like, uh, like why it's so important to come from like a liberal college um, or like well, just the, the, how good Lion is to us and how good this class is for us um, is because um, it teaches us how to um, look at all the information presented to us and uh, for us to be able to like make a decision whether or not like this is valid information, this is biased or unbiased. And um, I think that the electorate, elect electorate mm -hmm. today, um, they choose to ignore the biases that um, uh, the biases in the information that's presented to them, um, especially like uh, senators or uh, voters who are who 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 stick to their religious beliefs, other than scientific uh, uh, information. Okay, what did our founders want? Oh, you didn't read the article, right? Okay, uh, but you can look. You know, keep that's why our founders separated church and state. They said, when you're acting like a citizen, you have to make arguments based on data. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, and I would recommend that you look at it, right? They're going to rebel against the king, right? They're declaring war on their founders. Now, they, they didn't say, we think that he's of the devil, right? They didn't say, we think God wants us to replace them. Yeah, I mean, have any of you read it? Do you know how it works? How, how is it structured? I don't know if I could have answered that if I was in college either, but the, tr the way it's structured, and you ought to look back, it is obsessed about evidence. Here are the facts. Okay, so they define uh, a tyrant as somebody who abuses his power. He's using his power to centralize his power. He's not using it to promote the public good. That's the definition of corruption and he has no right to do that, right? His position is not an arbitrary position. He, he has to use that power for the well-being of people and he has no right to abuse it. So then it just says, let facts be you know, written down to explain why we're coming to this conclusion. And it's fact after fact after fact after fact, okay? So they're, they're using scientific method. They're obsessed with science. They're extremely progressive. Um, and they change their idea of God to fit their science, okay? Uh, Unitarians don't think Jesus was the Messiah because it's not rational. <laughs> Okay, so they're heretics, um, but they were really, really concerned that people learn, they vote on the basis of their pocketbooks, meaning 
has this ruler helped you become more prosperous or some other fact just facts and not bringing in god okay alex do you think we still do that okay you can turn on your mic yeah no not at all do the people you know refer to god like political party is closer to God's will or political leader? Um, the, the people that I choose to associate with do not, <laughs> but I, I believe I know some people do. Okay, so there is this association, right? It was put in the minds of people especially after 9-11. It was just part of the political rhetoric, but it does, it is, there is an association there. Remember, we, there was a handout on the Youth of Fro Day that we did, said God is not a Republican or a Democrat. Remember that? Um, so that would go back to the founders. They would not want to think that God takes sides in political life, okay? Um, Okay, um, Melanie, did you pick out something? Yes, and I think this kind of ties in to the conversation you guys were just having a little bit. Um, I picked, we need to educate for rational inquiry based on evidence or, or else allow ourselves to be manipulated by political rhetoric. Okay, okay. Um, I hope you liked this article because it seems to hit, you know, on some pretty important points. Um, can you give examples of what you would call political rhetoric? Anybody? Um, I think honestly, I don't know if this is right, but like a lot of the commercials during political debates um, like they try to get you, I don't know, like they try to get you to hate the other person like that they're running against um, and provide just kind of like a lot of low-key hateful information, I guess. I don't know. Why do people turn on ads in order to know who to vote for? I mean, don't people, I don't know. I mean, I would never buy a car based on the ad right? Because the ad is designed, like if your criteria is the sexiest girl on the hood, then, you know, you got to find a sexy girl, but it has nothing to do with whether you should buy this car, right? So I don't know why people turn on ads to find out who to vote for, because they've already had focus groups, and all they do is tell people what they have found out they want to hear. And I don't know. I mean, you're hiring somebody for a job, so you need to go find out their CV, right? Do they have experience in this? Have they been shown that they're good at it? Don't you think so? <laughs> oh, well. Um, all right. So this is, I think this is important. When our founders established the Republic, they really knew that broad-based education was necessary, but they couldn't decide on who's gonna pay for it. Do we still have that problem? Yeah, we do. <laughs> I think um, it's just, uh, 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 like, uh, removing college debt kind of thing, college loans are argument. Yeah, there's a big debate on all this. Is education an individual achievement or is it a collective and social benefit? Do you give people education because it weaves people together? It makes them more mature. It educates them about other people. It helps them, you know, motivates them to get along, um, motivates them to 
get better habits. They get in the habit of delayed gratification, right? You have to do your assignments and all that. So anybody want to speak to that? Do you think it's an individual achievement or a social and collective benefit? I think it's both. Okay. What about? I'm um, sorry. I think that education is an individual achievement um, because one, if you get educated, you get more money. Um, and then the social benefit is just the like after, like, like a after effect um, because the more people who are educated, the, the like the more our economy grows. Okay. If you just look at it as, as an individual achievement and you don't fund it, who gets to be the achiever? The one with the most money, right? The one whose daddy will pay the bill is the one who's labeled the highest achiever. Is that fair? No. Okay. And then the students who have to pay a lot and the prices go up, they have to work while they're in school. And so they don't do as well. Is that because they're stupider or lazier? But if you make it an individual achievement, that's where it ends up. Money sticks the money and it gets called achievement. That's, that annoys me. <laughs> um, what were the threats? All right. You have to picture this. This is important. Nations with monarchs or a class of aristocrats that inherit power, they want them to fail. And, and the USA was internally divided. So you needed a strong national identity. Um, poorly educated voters would elect demagogues who would appeal to class resentments, right? Okay, so do we ever have leaders that say, um, you know, demonize the rich and then say, if you vote for me, I'll fix it. I'll tax them and give you your money. Do we ever have leaders that say that? Anyway, you have to picture this. Um, if it's unstable, a military, you know, group of military will take over. I don't, I don't know. I don't think that would happen to us, but uh, it might. Um, so if you want centralized power, you want to keep the populace stupid and uh, blindly obedient, right? And so when we talked about Greece, we talked about how the whole culture was set up to get people to informed and conversing at the marketplace, remember, and the tragedies, everything was designed to get them to think critically. And so our founders knew about Greece, right? And so they wanted to set up something where the public would get educated for reflective thinking. Um, they, they had, it wasn't just a little city state, you know, they had to have a broader system of public education. What is this virtue? And so this section of the class is about so political virtue. So, so far we've focused on more like personal virtues, uh, temperance, courage, generosity, even temperedness, friendships. This one is about thinking of yourself as a citizen, how to relate to other people you don't even know, right? but you all live together under a common body of laws. And you have to think about what sort of laws and what sort of behaviors are gonna promote the common good, a stable, thriving society. If you just pursue your own interest, it will, money sticks to money, power sticks to power, and people will look for, to some strong man to uh, stabilize the society. It's, it won't last. People have to self-regulate. Um, 
you need education um, in order to recognize rhetoric. Um, that's what Socrates said, right? And that's what he was trying to do. Remember that? He went out and made leaders transparent. They had to explain what, what they're doing and why. Um, all right. Aristotle said, so we're back to Aristotle's virtues. The educational system has to support the constitution. So in a monarchy, it's really, really important that the children of the monarch learn to how to govern, how to use the power they're going to inherit for the well-being of the people, because they're going to inherit it. And if they're corrupt, they're really going to do damage, right? And create instability and maybe a revolution. In an aristocracy, again, a small group of families, their kids are going to inherit this privilege. They need to be taught to want to use it for the benefit of everyone. Otherwise, they'll fight amidst each other. The poor will get poorer. There will be instability. And then, there, then, then the, the masses will rise up and rebel. In a democracy, citizens have to be self-controlled and generous and virtuous. And then they can take turns ruling and being ruled. They have to have empathy. They, they won't be manipulated by political rhetoric. Freedom doesn't mean freedom to live as you like. It, it, means to, it means the freedom to be an adult and to be able to think clearly about how to make good laws and how to enforce them and how to govern. Like it's a privilege to think about what is good governance. So you would just value the fact you grew up in a society where you are required to think that way. Um, Okay, so people were worried we've changed the form of government, but we have to change the character of the people, right? Their habits, their opinions. They have to learn not to be servile. They have to learn not to look for some savior, some king, right? Or some aristocrats. They have to learn to be critical thinkers. And then the next question is who pays, right? But let me stop there for a minute. Is there anything you wanna comment on about what I've said so far? Would you what say what? Hey, Trump is a demagogue? Well, what do you think? Would you say Trump is a demagogue? Well, I, I think I, so. Okay, so why? What would your evidence be? Um, I don't really know what the definition is, oh. but he's kind of like, um, I, I saw a movie called A Face in the Crowd. I watched it last semester for um, political science, and it was like um, somebody who could influence the masses with, um, they could say anything and they would influence the masses. I feel like Trump is that person. Okay, so in order to argue that, you would just have evidence, right? Um, and uh, you'd have to, uh, you know, get media. I, it is a fact that the Republican Party no longer has any policies of the party, right? So in the past, the president would have to conform to the platform of the party. And so now the Republicans have no platform. They have explicitly said they're going to do whatever Mr. Trump wants, right? So that would be yeah. evidence, right? So I, you know, I, I don't want to give you answers, but I do want to make you aware that people are debating things like that, right? And, and that's part of the polarization is people disagree. And I don't want to polarize. So I just want you, I mean, I, I wish the students would try to gather some evidence, right? Just like our founders did 
for, you know, what, how do you compare Biden to Trump, right? How do they, what are their policy platforms? What sort of advisors do they have? What's, what sort of experience did they have coming into the job? Um, what, what, what is the job? I, I don't think Americans know what the job is. What sort of skills should you have? What sort of experience should you have to do the job? And then does, who does he appoint for his advisors? Do they have experience? What kind of experience do they have? And so also his cabinet, the head of the Housing and Human Services, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, the head of the Department of Defense, the head of the um, uh, Commerce, Department of Commerce, the head of the um, Department of Education. Like that's what I vote on the base basis of because it's this collective mind of people who have a lot of experience. They know how to deal with policy. I actually, one of my other careers, I was thinking of working in public policy because I do think it's really important. It has a lot of effect on people's lives that they often are not aware of. Um, so Melanie, did you have any comments so far? Um, not, not yet. I don't think so. So do you ever talk about, do people, you know, ever debate whether Trump is a demagogue or not? Um, no, okay. honestly. Okay. Well, you could, you know, think about that, that some people do think so. Some people don't think so. It's, it's just an open question. And then, um, a demagogue, well, okay, so have you ever heard a politician talk about establishment? They're against the establishment. That would be, you know, what entrenched privilege, right? And so this politician is going to be outside of the establishment and, um, and help the poor, help the underclass, right? That would be the kind of rhetoric he's talking about. Um, so what kind of virtue? Transcending your diverse self-interest, figuring out what's good for the political community. Um, if everyone just pursues private interest, then there will be instability and they will start looking for somebody who can fix it. Law and order candidate. Um, okay. All right, so Benjamin Rush. Okay, we did all this. Um, then here's the problem. How should we pay for it? The gentry, the privileged, preferred to hire tutors. Now, the analogy we have today is that we have a huge gap between the rich and the poor. And so the rich prefer not to pay taxes. Like the taxes for the rich are way lower than there used to be. Did I say this before? In under Eisenhower, it was 91%. Under Nixon, it was 75%. This would be a maximum if you don't give money away and you don't have any deductions. And then under Reagan, it was 50%. And under George W, it was 35%. And now under Trump, it went to something like 25% or something. So it was 91 and now it's 25, right? So when the wealthy don't have to pay taxes, they can save money so their kids can go to Harvard or Yale or whatever, right? And it's very similar to when the gentry just hired their tutors, right? It, it's just very few people have access to that level of education that will get you power, money, and privilege. And so that's always been a problem. So Jefferson wanted to tax the rich, right? Um, he wanted the people in power to be based on merit, that they, it was their motivation, they earned it, right? And if everyone has the same public education system, then if you work hard, the system will let you know what you're talented at. And then 
you can get a job related to your proven talent. Um, okay, so he wanted a new natural aristocracy. I hope you understand that. Does anyone have a question about that? I think Americans believe, right, that we have a more natural aristocracy based on virtue and talent rather than based on privilege. And it, it used to be more true than it is now. That's part of the article. Um, of course, it didn't include African Americans or women. So we're in that sense, we're, we're expanding. Um, okay, the problem was too many Americans, all they care about is money. Does that, is that still true? Aristotle said greed is the worst problem because money sticks the money. Then the poor revolt and then instability and then you've got a strong man. Okay, so, but he, pay attention to this because I think this is still true. The state legislators, anybody running for office is not going to vote to raise taxes because they won't get reelected. Everybody just wants to hear cut taxes, cut taxes, cut taxes. They don't think about what is it the taxes pay for, right? So then it went from the state down to the county, right? So local people, well, the trouble is when there's so few people, they would have to pay a lot to get a decent school. So if you pay into the national or you pay statewide, each person pays less so that all the kids can get a decent education because only a third of the families actually have kids in the schools. So if everybody paid a certain amount for public education, everybody would get a decent education. You pool your resources. But if you can't, legislators can't get elected if they want to tax people for schools, then it goes down to local. And that's kind of what's happening now is that we have people in suburbs where the houses are worth a million bucks and they pay taxes for their public school, which gets a whole lot of money. So it's just like a private school. The money per student is really high. And then up in the inner city, which is an inner city because of racism, African-Americans didn't have a chance to get houses, better houses and houses that increase in value. So I, there's a whole book about that. But anyway, so in the, that area, they don't pay many taxes. So the schools don't get funding. And so in the name of public education based on local control of the taxes, you have this huge gap between what the poor are getting and what the rich are getting. And all the good jobs require something like all the way through college education. So there's a huge chunk of people that have very little chance of making it into a decent job. Okay. Sorry, the solution to that issue, a lot of people would say, that sounds like communism. Right. Okay. And that's why, are you calling our founders communists? Right. That's why I'm not polarizing, right? It's just a problem. How are you going to get people educated? Right. So it's just, how do you solve the problem? Um, the poor can't pay enough to get their kids educated enough. So do you just tax people and distribute it so that everybody gets a decent education so you don't have an underclass that starts rebelling against the system because the system is so cruel to them. Um, all right. Uh, the common people were uneducated. They were not convinced that education was worth it. They preferred buying consumer goods. They didn't trust educated people. Does this sound familiar? Yes. Trump it, supporters? Well, again, I'm not polarizing. I'm just saying, does this sound familiar? And our founders 
were worried about it. That's my spiel. Our founders were worried about this. We're not going to have a democracy unless we have educated citizens. Um, here's another issue in the North. In the North, people did change their mind and they, they started paying for public education. And it did lead to more social mobility. Who is Jack? Is that your machine that's on? Um, it did lead to social mobility. People, something is making noise. Um, you you want to turn your mic? Yeah, okay. Social mobility. Uh, people could move up the social ladder um, in the north. And even now, they have a huge, New York has a big system of uh, public education. Um, it's got its problems, but it really has a lot of standards and high, way higher standards than the South, right? So Arkansas, Mississippi, these states rank 47, 48, 49, 50. And so students can work harder. They can want to get an education. And it just isn't there. It's not available to them. And then you think, is that democratic or not? Um, because if you if you think equality, equal opportunity of education is a democracy, you have to tax people. I'm sorry. And you have to have, but you have to have good people making the laws, setting up the schools, running the schools. Um, so what he said was the South got 50 years behind uh, right up at the beginning, right? Uh, long ago in the 1820s, um, the Northerners got 50 years ahead and Southerners are still playing catch up. Um, all right. Um, so until the 70s, there was a lot of investment in education, jobs changed. People had more jobs that took higher levels of education. And then the philosophy changed. And so the goal is no longer virtue, but money. And advertisement success is defined by wealth. You're expected to seek your self-interest. Um, today, student debt is a problem. We don't have, knowledge is not for its own sake or for appreciating art. I mean, and all of you, you know, you are at a liberal arts school and you do have to take some of these classes. And it, the idea under it was exactly what the founders, right? They founded these small liberal arts colleges. We have better writers, thinkers, uh, more creative people thinking of new ideas, uh, less crime. And the South has all these problems. Um, you know, more than the North. It isn't just education, there's a whole lot of stuff, but without education, it's hard to get out of these problems. That's the main thing. Um, let's see. Ah, then there's the demonization of government, like Alex said. The politicians started calling the schools uh, rotten, right? That public schools are brainwashing, they're immoral, they're anti-democratic because freedom means homeschooling, you know, teaching your kid whatever you want to teach them. Um, funding is reduced. Competition is ratcheted up. Uh, rich don't want to pay taxes. Um, all right. So is, do you think public education is anti-democratic? Is there anything, is there an entity, education for citizenship? Okay, and I'm, I'm gonna, um, let me stop here and ask, you know, clock in. What comment would you like to make, Alex, on any of that section? Well, wait, I'll ask, I'll ask Melanie. Actually, I haven't talked to Melanie for a while. What do you think? Um, I mean, I don't know. Can you, 
what which part was that again i'm trying to pull it up on my computer can you see it when i'm showing it yeah i'm yeah i can see it okay well the idea is just when i'm talking you would just pick a point out right because you know that i'm going to call on you so yeah i don't know i guess i didn't really have a comment on that section okay um what about you jack um i think at least uh community college should be free okay now should it be free based on your family's income right like Ivanka Trump's kids don't need a free community college, right? Right. I think they would go to a better school, though. It's true, except that I don't think the wealthiest people need free community college, right? Right. Um, so I think it should be anybody below a certain family income. You'd have the, the income and the size, you know, income per person. You'd have to fill out some forms, right? Those, that dang government, that bureaucracy. But anyway, then that would be middle class and below would get it so that they could have some upward mobility. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay, but again, the rhetoric, either it's all free or it's communism and nobody's free, right? Right. Rather, yeah, it's just crazy. That's why you have to step back and not let it polarize you, right? Don't let it be a button because neither one of those is at all sensical. Um, uh, okay, Alex, did you, uh, can you talk? Yes, I'm ready. Um, what an interesting, part that we went over was the the polarization with the north and the south it just highlights like that polarization is not a good thing because um they're basically just like from the beginning of the united states the, our history the north and south have always been like i'm not going to do what you're going to do what you're doing because that's dumb and that's stupid um and I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. And they don't, they don't have a conversation with each other um, because like, like putting funding into public schools is, is a good thing, but that doesn't mean that being homeschooled is a bad thing, you know? It depends on what, right? I mean, I have one of my former students wrote a whole book about homeschooling because um, she did homeschool her kids. It's great. You know, I know her. She would have been a great teacher. But there are other homeschool. The reason they homeschool is to make sure their student, their kids don't learn evolution or they don't take it seriously, right? They have to study it to pass a test. But so just in general, do you think our country benefits when a certain percentage of citizens do not learn scientific method? Are we going yeah. to be able? Are we going to be able to compete with the Chinese? No. Well, I mean that's. I. Okay. Well, I mean you can't force people to believe something. Right. If they don't want to. Right. It's so, just. I mean, China would say, "Yeah, I, they should all do this." But, but Americans, I think... Americans, I don't think they get approached with that, right? Do you want the Chinese to be able to take over economically? No. What do we have to do, right? And then it would be, we really need to educate our, our kids, right? Especially in STEM, which is partly why the public schools are so into STEM, right? And at least have that discussion. That's all, Jack because the laws are set up. No, you don't have to. It's just sort of like, maybe you could persuade somebody to want to. Does that make sense, Jack? Mm -hmm. Yes. You can learn science and leave evolution out of it, but you know, it's important that your kid learns math and science, and engineering and stuff. So that's just, a, again, a way to break down the polarization, It right? 
every time an issue is presented as polarizing, step back and figure out what's the problem here, right? We want to have a middle class. How can I describe the problem in a way that will rule out these two poles, right? Um, okay, and then the last section is about since 2007, there's been an, a, another huge cut in funding for the schools. So I have a student, a former student, who is working in Teach for America in Oklahoma. And a few years ago, I mean, Oklahoma doesn't have a lot of funding for schools anyway. Do you know how much they cut it? 90%. 90, nine, oh, they cut 90% of the funding for the schools. It just boggles my mind. Um, so there's more Medicare costs because people are sicker. There's more jails and prisons. Arkansas is number one in obesity. So diabetes, heart disease. Um, okay, so students have to pay more. The tuition goes up. The lower income students can't apply. They have to work. They can't do their best. And so we are retreating from this and there will be costs. That's what he's saying. Um, and the politicians, yeah, this is important. They claim to honor our founders, but at the same time, they're pushing to privatize education, which is the opposite of what the founders said. All right, that's just a fact. That shouldn't be polarizing, it's just a fact right? What are our common beliefs? Now, this, this is the part of the article I really don't like, because he's a historian. He says, previously, it was Protestant Christianity, and now there doesn't seem to be any creed. You know, we just disagree on everything. And I'm just saying, wait a second, what about Aristotle, right? I mean, hey, guy, you're a historian. Uh, and the liberal arts schools were based on actually learning Greek and Latin, Aristotle, but why can't we just take these virtues and the, these would be the foundation. Aristotle himself was sexist, racist, whatever. But you, I mean, there's nothing in these virtues that, that is sexist or racist, right? Or classes. So why not? I don't understand this. And this class is structured around, yes, we do. We have a common foundation. There is a creed that's very consistent with our, our founding. It's very consistent with democracy. It's what the Athenians tried to cultivate. They failed, but it was there. And that's our model for how we could preserve our democracy. Now, those were all the personal virtues. Then we have the art of legislation. Do our laws promote citizenship and social and political well being? How do we distribute wealth? Should taxpayers pay for a higher quality of education? Um, should the tax structure be progressive? That is, if you're richer, you pay more, right? Um, is the fact that the top 20% has something like 40% of the wealth, is that bad for a democracy, um, right? And, and that, in the name of rhetoric, in the name of freedom, the rich are getting richer right now and the poor are getting poorer, right? Because you don't want communism, right? <laughs> That's lack of freedom. Um, how do we structure for opportunity, equality of opportunity? How do we apply the laws? And then the intellectual virtues are, how do you get a good education in science, social science, writing, you know, all those intellectual skills. So um, here, your responses. Um, how does the article relate to what you've already read in Plato and Aristotle? Um, 
New York is a more socialist state. It has higher taxes and higher services and better education and better health care and higher quality of life. Is that so bad, right? And people are self-regulating. It's not like Stalin or it's not like communism. It's like good education and good health care. That's what it's like. Um, how much citizens today depend upon um, decisions that politicians make. They have an impact over time. So the Southern states have always wanted to keep the government out of my life, especially the federal government, right? And they're suffering a lot. And as long as they keep beating on that drum, they'll continue right? They're not trying to, the problems aren't going to get solved, but it's complicated and there's a lot of ways to look at it. Um, but okay, Melanie, what would be, what's your takeaway from this article? Um, my takeaway from this article, I thought it was interesting, like the definition of education um like for me personally my definition of education would be like based on um like experiences and knowledge gained through experiences as well as like you know knowledge that's been learned um but yeah and also i i thought it was interesting how what we just talked about um like top the top one or 1% of Americans have 40% of the wealth. And no, that is not good for a democracy because that leaves 1% of the entire population with that much fiscal power over everybody. That's just dangerous. And they also now um, contribute a lot to political campaigns, right? And then the campaigns say, you know, I'll cut your taxes, right? And, there, and it's really, when you cut taxes, the rich benefit a lot more than everybody else. So if I pay a few hundred dollars more taxes, but also rich folk pay a lot more percentage wise, we get better schools and better parks and better healthcare. But the rhetoric, Oh, taxes, right? It's nobody looks like scratch the surface, you know? Does that make sense, Melanie? Yes. Okay, um, Jack. Um, I think the takeaway is um, education is a public good and the essential pillar of free government. I think that was a quote. But I think that sums it up. Okay. Do you think the people you know think that way? Or do you think they just haven't thought about it? Um, I don't think people I know really think deeply about this kind of stuff, honestly. It's too bad. You don't have to think real deep. You just have to think twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just step back. Okay. That's why I like this article. So you can go send it to your buddies. Um, <laughs> What about you, Alex? Um, so I think the takeaway from this one was um, uh, for us to shift from the mindset of individual achievement, achievement <laughs> to like communal benefit. Um, and you you had asked like, well, does do you know anyone who like who who like oh, sorry. I lost my chain of thought, but <clears throat> um, do you know anyone who like was scratched the, sur the surface of like why it would be a good idea to um, uh, remove the, the, the student loans, the student debt? And um, my own personal benefit. Um, I wasn't truly thinking about like 
how it could how it could help the, the economy, how it could help us as a society. Yes, it would like um, like throwing money out there could possibly like like cost us a lot of money if people don't um, make use of that privilege or or, or that uh, that gift. Um, I'm, I'm not sure those are the correct words, privilege or gift. Um, where was I going? Um, but. Uh, well, you could structure this differently, right? It does depend upon how you set it up. So in Arkansas, the Walton family is, is this huge education center. They want to destroy public education and they want everything to be charters, okay? And they brought in a guy, a guy from New York City and someone from New York City does not understand the issues in Arkansas. 25% of the kids in Arkansas are homeschooled and that's related to evolution. I mean, <laughs> and it's not regulated very well. So I know someone and they have charter schools now, and that's paid for tax by taxes. And there was a guy, a woman told me she worked for a charter school. This, this guy started it. Anybody can start it. My son started a charter school. But in Minnesota, oh my God, they're really regulated. And they're, it's very difficult. But in Arkansas, it's not regulated. And it, they're not checked up on. So some guy from the Church of Christ started a school and hired all the people from the Church of Christ. And you can imagine what they taught them, right? You don't have to have credentials. You don't, I mean, it's, but that's freedom, right? Freedom to educate, tell your kid whatever you want to tell them. Um, like America is God's plan for the world. I, did I tell you I had a student who I said in class that teaching Darwin is not about the meaning of life. It's just about scientific method. And it's, it's like if you had a history professor that was a Mormon, you wouldn't really want the whole year to be spent on Joseph Smith and the Mormons, right? Your, your teacher's just teaching you historical method, how to think about history. And this kid came afterwards and he said, Dr. Beck, my history book, and he was homeschooled, said that God caused the storm that smashed the Spanish Armada so that Protestantism would prevail in the West. You guys know about that? That's a history book. <laughs> That's not historical method, right? What if your teacher, your history teacher at Lyons said, oh, well, this was a God-caused event. <laughs> what would the students in the class, I think, I hope, you know, it would be jaw-dropping. Um, anyway, so there's the problem of how do you want students to get a decent education? If so, who's going to pay for it? If so, how do you tax it? Do you have a progressive tax system or a regressive one where everybody pays the same, then the poor suffer a lot more. You have a progressive system. Then you have a system where highly trained people set it up, create a good institutional structure. Then they appoint people to run the institution who again are highly trained, dedicated to the common good. Then you have the kids, right? And they're monitored and you keep track of whether they're learning and there's accountability and there's transparency. Now, anything can fall apart anywhere along the way. And the fact that the South got behind 50 years ago, I, want, I just want you to understand when you step into history, what you have in front of your face is a function of a whole lot of decisions that were made way before you were born, right? And you're still suffering or benefiting from these choices, the way the society was set up. 
but eventually you're going to be the one who's going to be setting up the society for the next generation. So I, I, in order for you to understand you have skin in the game, it matters. You have to realize that it matters what people before you did, right? That should motivate you to care about what you do and pass on to the next generation. For example, we have not structured a society that's sustainable and you will suffer a lot from that. And there were a lot of people who knew we needed to do that and we did not do it. So now you will suffer, guaranteed, bona fide. And I'm sorry about that. It's just that if I can just give you the sense that it matters what people before you did. And so it matters what you do. It matters what you pass on to your kids and your grandkids. Um, all right, so let me try some. Another issue is there's a paper due on Friday. And so this is the paper rubric. If you've had me in a class before, but we don't have that much time left. It's just if you want to stay after class to talk about it, or I have office hours. Um, I can have some, I can, I can have office hours. You can just email me if you want to talk about the requirements. They're, I think they're pretty generic, pretty general. But um, if you have any questions, just email me about when an office hour would work. On Monday, you give a presentation of your paper. You don't read the paper, you give your summary of the paper and you'll be graded on whether your paper should have a thesis, you know your stuff, you deliver it well and you're organized. Then um, I have the paper topics here. And it goes all the way back to the Greek, you know, to Crito, Socrates, Euthyphro. So I have a number of questions there. And there's a lot of options. So I think as you read through this list, it's kind of a summary of what we've done so far in class. So one thing is relationships. Socrates is accused of corrupting the youth. Crito tells Socrates he has to raise his kids. Euthyphro takes his father to court, right? Well, what is that, you know, what about relationships, right? What do they tell us about life in Athens? How does that compare to our family values and our ideas of relationships? What about corrupting the youth, not believing in the city's gods? You could talk about that. Um, what about what the masses believe versus the aristocrats, right? And so this is a big issue about the educated elite manipulating the uneducated, right? Um, the problem about social class, social climate. Then you have um, what Crito has a number of principles. Socrates has a number of principles. And then Euthyphro also has principles, so you can compare those. Um, what about their experiences with the courts and the legal system? What does it tell you about the legal system in Athens? Is there anything analogous with what's going on in our society? What about holiness, right? Do you think Euthyphro is holy or Socrates? Are there examples in our society? of people who claim to be holy who aren't, right? Um, let's see, a person who exhibits Aristotle's character traits, right? I had that, I had six questions that you were supposed to come to class with. You could write an essay on that person. You could write an essay, Socrates has the character traits in Aristotle, Socrates' way of life and Jesus' way of life. Aristotle's virtues and Jesus. Um, and then there was Tippett, remember the biology of the spirit, um, his experiences with a pretty strict religion. And then there's his point about human spirituality as biological. 
And then the McCullough talked about revenge and forgiveness. Um, I don't have any paper topics there of, about the depression and the stress, but if you want to write about those, you can meet with me and we can talk about it. I have the whole thing about unjust suffering. So if you wanna write about unjust suffering, stuff, some of it's the human condition, some of it is social, right? Socially constructed. And um, that's different when you suffer from racism versus suffering from um, stuffing yourself <laughs> and throwing up or something like that. And, and then I had examples of unjust suffering in the lives of these people. That includes the depression and the stress. Um, and, and I have been asking you to sort out what you think. And also, even if it's not what you think, you know people who think, oh, it's God's will. Like some people are always saying it's God's will. So do you agree with that? Some people say it's never God's will. It, I, there's no God, right? Keep God out of it. It's over here. And then the middle ground would be God wants us to use our reason. There's, there shouldn't be, it shouldn't be polarized, right? God doesn't want us to be stupid. God doesn't want us to vote for a demagogue who says he's, he represents God, right? Does that, everybody understand that? So you can sort through, I just ask you questions, um, sorting through in your mind. And if you wanna write a whole paper on that, you can, you just need to meet with me. Then you are required, once you get an outline for your paper, you're required to come to me and talk about it because I can help you. I can find references, page numbers, or and then I can also help you expand your mind or help you clarify what's on your mind. So again, I think you should just make an appointment, but I'll be around. Um, I think I'll, I'll be around tomorrow night, 8.30 to 10. And then the next night, Thursday, 8.30 to 10. And the papers due Friday, maybe three in the afternoon. Um, all right, any questions? Melanie, you okay? Yeah. Okay, well, then I will see you at during a conference at some point. All right. Bye bye.